Wormwood, the most alarming thing in your last account of the patient is that he is making none of those confident resolutions which marked his original conversion. No more lavish promises of perpetual virtue, I gather. Not even an expectation of an endowment of grace for life, but only a hope for the tiny daily and hourly amount to meet the daily and hourly temptation. This is very bad. I see only one thing to do at the moment. Your patient has become humble. Have you drawn his attention to the fact? All virtues become less formidable to us once someone is aware that they have them, but this is especially true of humility. Catch him at the moment when he is really poor in spirit, and then smuggle into his mind the gratifying reflection of how humble he is being. Almost immediately, pride, pride at his own humility, will appear. If he awakes to the danger and tries to smother this new pride, make him proud of the attempt, and so on, for as many times as you like. Though, don't keep going for too long, lest you awake his sense of humor and proportion, and then he will just laugh at you and go to bed. But there are other profitable ways of fixing his attention on the virtue of humility. By this virtue, as by all others, our enemy wishes to turn the man's attention from self to him and to the man's neighbors. All the humility and self-hatred are designed in the long run solely for this purpose, and unless they attain it, they do us little harm. They may even do us good if they keep the man concerned with himself, and above all, if self-contempt can be used as a starting point for contempt of other selves, and thus lead to gloom, cynicism, and cruelty. You must therefore conceal from the patient the true purpose of humility. Let him think of it not as self-forgetfulness, but as a certain kind of opinion, namely a low opinion, of his talents and character. Some talents, I gather, he really has. Fix in his mind the idea that humility consists in believing that those talents have less value than he believes they have. No doubt they are less valuable than he believes them to be, but that is not the point. The great thing is to make him value an opinion for something other than truth, and thus to introduce an element of dishonesty and make-believe into what otherwise threatens to become a virtue. By this method, thousands of humans have been brought to think that humility means pretty women trying to believe they are ugly, and clever men trying to believe they are fools. And since what they are trying to believe is often manifest nonsense, they cannot really succeed in believing it, and we are given the opportunity to keep their minds constantly revolving around themselves, trying to achieve the impossible. To anticipate the enemy's strategy, we must consider his aims. The enemy wants to bring a person to a state of mind where they could design the best cathedral in the world, and know it to be the best, and rejoice in that fact, without being any more or less or otherwise happy than if it had been done by another. The enemy wants them in the end to be so free of any bias in their own favor that they can rejoice in their own talents as frankly and gratefully as the talents of their neighbors, or a sunrise, an elephant, or a waterfall. He wants each human in the long run to be able to recognize all creatures, even themselves, as glorious and excellent things. He wants to kill their animal self-love as soon as possible, but it is his long-term policy, I fear, to restore to them a new kind of self-love, a charity and gratitude for all selves, including their own. When they have learned to love their neighbors as themselves, they will be allowed to love themselves as their neighbors. For we must never forget that most repellent and inexplicable trait of our enemies, that he really loves these hairless biopeds he has created, and he never fails to give them with his right hand what he is taking away with his left. His whole effort, therefore, will be to get your man's mind off the subject of his own value altogether. He would rather your man think himself a great architect or a great poet, and then forget about it, than to spend great pains trying to think himself a bad one. Your efforts to instill either vanity or false modesty into the patient will therefore be met from the enemy's side with the obvious reminder that a man is not usually called upon to have an opinion of his own talents at all, since he can very well go on improving them to the best of his ability without having to decide on his precise niche in the temple of fame. You must try to exclude this reminder from the patient's consciousness at all costs. The enemy will also try to render real to your patient's mind that doctrine which they all profess but find very difficult to bring home to their feelings. The doctrine that they did not create themselves, that their talents were given them, and they might as well be proud of the color of their hair. But always and by all methods the enemy's aim will be to get the patient's mind off such questions, and yours will be to fix it on them. Even of his sins the enemy does not want him to think too much. Once they are repented, the sooner he turns his mind outwards, the better the enemy is pleased. <laughs>